become envious. Remember the one thing that Pilate said concerning Christ standing before him. He said they, he realized that they had brought him to him because of envy. The envy and the jealousy of the religious leaders is what had them cry out, crucify Christ. They were scared of him. They were scared concerning all the crowns that were following him. They were scared of, from Rome. But well, friends, let me tell you, anytime anybody acts in fear, they do the wrong action. Fear never gets a positive result. Amen? We are people of faith. If anything, we need to face life's problem with faith. That things are going to get better. Amen? We need to face it in hope. Amen? The hope of the resurrection. The hope of the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the hope that God said He would supply all of our needs according to His riches and glory. And friends, I want to tell you, the stock market might crash. Banks might go bust. But there's one thing that won't ever happen. God will never go bust. He will always have the resources to meet our needs on every plane, on every level. You will never lack for any good thing if you'll walk with the Lord, if you'll walk with the Almighty God. Amen? Amen. Now, when we look at this, we see the stages being set for the journey of our Lord to the cross and the empty tomb. He comes, He cleanses the temple because they're selling sheep. They're taking advantage of the people there. And Jesus drives them out and said that he that they had made His Father's house a den of thieves. But His house was to be a house of prayer. Amen? Always remember, God's house is a house of prayer. When we come together, we come together to touch God through our prayers and through our praise. And when we touch God, we have the results that were testified about this morning. We have stage 4 cancer that God takes care of. We have Sister Karen who's now going to have a normal life after a year and a half. Her healing is coming along. Why? Because we serve a God that's still a God of miracles. That's still a God of power. That's still a God of strength. And who loves to give the devil a black eye. Amen? I like to pray and see God act because I know when I see God working, the devil's miserable. And if I can make the devil miserable, I've had a good day. Amen? So when we look at this, Jesus comes, He eats the Passover supper with His disciples, and He portrays His death with the bread and the wine. These elements will become the Holy Communion that we will observe at the close of this service. It represents His death. And then as we remember it, we remember His resurrection. That's why I thank God that we come together on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is a memorial to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Early Christians met on the first day of the week because Jesus arose from the dead on the first day of the week. So we might say every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Every Sunday when we come to worship... We come to worship not a Christ nailed to a cross. We come to worship a Christ who's alive, sitting at the right hand of the Father forever to make intercession for you and for me. Amen? Amen. Folks, not only is the cross empty, the tomb is empty, but if you know Jesus Christ as we do, then your heart is full of the love of God and the peace of God and the joy of the Lord, which becomes your strength. Judas, he's going to betray the Lord, while Jesus and the rest of His disciples go to the Garden of Gethsemane so that He can pray concerning the Father's will in His life. Now folks, when He prays, He is showing us His humanity, but He is also showing us an example of how we are supposed to face crisis moments in our life. Jesus didn't just 
do a five minute prayer. Jesus prayed through the night. In fact, He prayed to the point that He touched the Father. And He prayed to the point that He got the answer and He could say, Father, not my will, but Thy will be done. He accepted the will of the Father to go to Calvary. He went there willingly and He went there obediently. It was our sin that put Him there. It wasn't the crowds, although they cried crucify Him, but it was our sin that nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. He who knew no sin, He who was sinless, took upon Him our sin that we might enjoy God's grace and mercy to us. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. At the conclusion of the prayer, Jesus sees the crowd coming. Judas is right there in front of them. And Judas says to them, the one that I kiss, the kiss of betrayal, that's the one sees him. And so now we have what is called, and we hear throughout the ages, the kiss of death. Jesus kissed Jesus as a friend, and yet he was a traitor. The interesting thing is, folks, is this. Judas still had the opportunity to be saved. Just because he denied the Lord at that time and betrayed the Lord did not seal his fate. As long as there was life and breath in his body, he could have cried out, Lord, forgive me, and repented of his sin, and God would forgive him. But the problem is, he went out and he hanged himself. And after death, there's no more repentance. There's no more change. It's what we do on this side of the grave which will determine where we will spend eternity. It's why we still have that breath of life. And I thank God for the many times that I've been called by the bedside of an individual who's lived like the devil most of their lives. And yet, as they began to face death, and as they began to face reality, they called for a preacher. And we were able to tell them about Jesus. And that even where they were at that point, God would still forgive them. And they could still have eternal life. And then just to see how the conviction of the Lord would come upon them. And in their hospital bed, they would begin to cry. And God would wondrously save them. And just an hour or more, they would pass out from this life into eternity with the knowledge, like the thief on the cross, they were going to be with Jesus. Amen? So I'm glad that God will take us right up to death and still forgive us. Amen? That God is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God waits on us. We see Jesus having a mock trial. He's presented to Pontius Pilate, and Pilate wants to let him go. He finds no reason to kill him. But the people said, give us Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Now, Pilate did something that really means nothing. He called for a basin. And he washed his hands like he's washing his hands of the whole incident. But friends, everybody that had a part in the crucifixion of the Lord, the blood of the Lord Jesus was on their hands. It was on Pilate's hands. It was on the Jewish leader's hands. It was on the crowds that cried, crucify Him. And friend, if an individual dies in their sin, the blood of Jesus is upon them. I'm glad that when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, all our bad stuff is forgiven. The slate is wiped clean. He puts our name in the Lamb's book of life. And I believe He's preparing, and you read the book of Revelation, that there's going to be a little white stone. And when you get to heaven, that little white stone is going to be given to you, and it's going to have a name that only you and God will know. God has a name for you in heaven. He has a new name to show how different you are. Amen? Is it no wonder that God says old things have passed away? Behold, all things have become new. Amen? When we come to know Jesus Christ, 
things are new. We have a new peace. We have a new joy. We have a new spring in our step. Amen. To know that the burden of sin has been taken away and God has forgiven us. This brings us to the truth of Jesus speaking from the cross. The last words of an individual are considered by many as the most important words an individual speak. And in Jesus' case, it contains His dying messages to the church. Don't you know that? Every one of you, when you have a precious loved one that's passing, <laughs> you want to hear those last words. What are they saying? Are they saying, I love you? Are they saying, be at peace? Are they saying, don't worry, I'm going to see Jesus? All those last words you want to hear. And this Jesus speaks from the cross. There are words not only do we want to hear, but we need to hear. The first thing we're going to look at, we're going to skip over one that says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We'll take that on next Sunday. We're going to follow to the one that says to us, Oh, actually, that's the one we're going to deal with. Father, forgive them for we know not what they do. He calls them Father. He expresses the personal relationship He has with Almighty God. Aren't you glad that Jesus taught you and He taught me how to pray and He taught us to pray our Father? You see, you're not talking to a mystical entity. You're talking to a personal God. A personal God who likes to be personally involved in your life. When you're hurting, God wants to be there to heal your heart. When you're broken, God wants to be there to put your life back together. When you're sick, God wants to be the healer that will raise you up. When you feel weak and feeble, God wants to be the strength that you walk by. Whatever you need in this life and the life to come, God wants to be that to you. And He will be if we let Him be. You see, we need to cry out to God before things get bad. Amen? We need to have a walking relationship with God that the moment anything seems to be going bad, we immediately turn to God and say, God, help me. God, give me strength. God, give me wisdom. God, give me knowledge. God, give me direction. When we do that and we act in faith, guess what God does? He gives us strength. He gives us wisdom. He gives us knowledge. He gives us a direction. Amen? And I want to tell you, when we are walking down God's straight and narrow path, and He is the Good Shepherd, He's leading us to the still water. He's leading us to the green pastures. What? He's leading us to the good stuff. Amen? <laughs> Whatever you have need of, God's leading you right there. If you don't have any peace this morning, if you'll just turn to God, God will bring you to His peace. The peace which surpasseth all understanding. You lack joy this morning, God will fill you with the joy of the Lord and it will strengthen you. You need comfort this morning, God will be your comfort today. And if you don't know Him and you need a Savior, God will be your Savior, your Redeemer. He will be your elder brother. He will be your eternal life if you'll just invite Him into your life. Amen. You cannot lose with God, folks. Amen. You can lose on a lot of other things, but you cannot lose with God. Amen. You can lose, even if you've got your best friend, you can lose. But if God's your best friend, you'll never lose. Amen. The Bible teaches that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us and gave Himself for us. More than conquerors. Amen. He tells us that we are more than victorious. That in Jesus Christ, when He is our with our Heavenly Father, we are victorious over the enemy. We are victorious over the grave. Amen. When we realize this, then God, we can cry out, Our Father who art in heaven. And then He went right to the source of forgiveness. Father, forgive. Father, forgive. Do you know... 
Sad to say, and all of us have experienced the forgiving grace of God, forgiving our sins. But it seems like the hardest things for Christians to do, even after they have been forgiven themselves, is to forgive others. That's sad. Amen? Somebody does us wrong, sometimes there's just too much of the world left in us, and we want to get even. We want to get mad. And getting even and getting mad steals our peace. Steals our joy. Steals our comfort. I have seen through over 40 years of ministry that when enemies come against me, the best thing I can do is go tattle to God. Amen. Go tell God about it. Because God has a way of dealing with your enemies. God has a way of dealing with those who hurt you. And you know what the best way God does when He's dealing with them? Saving them. Forgiving their sins. And changing them into a new creation. Because if they're changed, they'll no longer be your enemy. They'll be there for you. Amen? So, He says, Father, forgive. This morning, because what happened at Calvary, the fountain of God's forgiveness was open. Whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come and drink of the fountain freely. God calls us, even if we're here today and we've kind of got slack in our walk with God, God wants to forgive us our slackness and make us better than the ever ready bunny. Amen. Give us a lot of energy of faith, give us a lot of power. Give us a lot of strength. You see, sometimes in life, it's going to be like you're hanging by a thread. Crisis come that way. Their crisis because you weren't expecting it. It just comes roughly to you. But don't you know that God who forgives is also the God who knows all things? And God knew it was coming. And God had the grace all ready for you. And all you had to do was ask. Amen? All you had to do is ask. I have found that the best thing to do when it seems like you're being overwhelmed, just cry out, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. And the interesting thing, when you cry out with that in faith, there's a certain peace that comes to your mind. And that cloudiness seems to fade away. And there comes a complete insight in what God wants you to do. There's a peace. There's a comfort. And although your situation may not have changed, there's a hope that says, it's going to get better. Amen? If you're breathing today, it's going to get better. <laughs> it's going to get better. Your life is going to get better. Walking with Jesus will make it better. Strengthening your faith will make it better. There's nothing that is happening in your life that God won't make it better through Jesus Christ. So then he says, not only, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He said, this, some of them did it intentionally. Others did it unintentionally. There are things today that people do intentionally against you, and you know it. But then sometimes people do stuff unintentionally. They didn't mean to. But you still get mad. Because that's what people do. <laughs> but God is saying, don't let a root of bitterness grow up. Amen? We need to let God, with the Holy Spirit, spray weed eater on those bitter roots. Amen? And kill them at the root. Amen? But He won't until we're willing to have them plucked up. Until we're allowing Him to let His grace pull it from us. And it starts right here. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Lord, they didn't know what they were doing to me. Maybe they did it in ignorance. Father, they may have known what they were doing. But God, You forgive them. I forgive them. Two things happen. When you are ready to forgive then you are ready to be forgiven. Did you get that? When you are ready to forgive, you are ready 
to be forgiven. For if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will God forgive you your trespasses. Amen? The moment you decide to forgive, guess what? Your bondage is broken. Your shackles are loosed. You are set free. Amen? And you'll know you are set free. Now notice, people misuse that word and say, well, I forgive them. My friends, part of forgiveness is forgetting. If you don't forget it, you haven't forgiven them. Amen? If every time you see that person you're supposed to be forgiven, you suddenly you want to get at them again, you haven't forgiven them. Amen. Amen. If every time you see them you want to twist their head off, you haven't forgiven them. Amen. Amen. It's hard. I, I, I'll be right here and tell you. It's hard for you to do it, but it's not hard for you and God to do it. Amen. If you will lean on the Lord, the Lord will take you by the arm and take you by the hand and they will lead you away from that bitterness and lead you to a place of joy and lead you to a place of peace. Amen. And friends, I want to tell you, the best thing Christians have going for them is peace of mind. Amen. To be at peace with God. To know your sins are forgiven and to know you don't have anything bad against anybody. Amen. You can lay down at night and go to sleep. Amen? You don't have to have your sleep interrupted because you took the first step on a willingness to forgive. Now the second blessing about this is not only do you set yourself up to forgive, but when you lose their bonds through forgiving them, and you don't have to see them face to face to forgive them, you get down on your knees before God and say, Father, right wherever they are, I can't reach them, I can't touch them, but Lord, in my heart, I forgive them. This might be somebody that hurt you 20, 30, 40 years ago, but you're still carrying that bitterness. All you've got to do is, Father, I forgive them. And walk away from it. And that part, when you forgive, and you say, Lord, forgive me, you open them up to be forgiven. Because until you forgive them, they are bound in their sin. They are bound because you're not turning them loose. Amen? Now I'm going to tell you, I haven't seen anybody in my lifetime that's worth holding them in their sin and causing them to die and go to heaven. Not a one. Amen? And I've had some folks do some pretty dirty stuff to me as a minister. I've had people spit on me. I've had people come at me with a, with a pistol just because I wanted to tell them about Jesus. The beautiful thing is God still opened the door. I still went in. He put the gun on the table and we prayed Him through to old time gospel salvation. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Nobody's bigger than God. Friend, it is it. No matter what's in your life, it's not bigger than God. God is bigger than whatever is happening in your life. And He will be there when you let your faith go. Father, I believe you're, this mountain's going to be moved. I'm speaking to the mountain, and it's going to be moved. I'm speaking to the mountain of my bitterness. I'm speaking to the mountain of my unbelief. I'm speaking to the mount, uh, mountain of my broken heart. And God will move it. How do I know He moves? Because once you pray that and you really mean it, and you pray through like Jesus did in the garden, there'll be peace in your heart. There'll be peace in your entire spirit. And the next time you talk, let's see that person, yeah, for a little while, it might be like picking a sore, you know. You still see a little bit of it. But the more you keep going to God, the more God will put the healing balm of Gilead on that soreness, that bitterness. And before you know it, you'll think about that person and you won't think about them in a bad way. You'll think about them as somebody for whom Jesus died. Somebody for whom Jesus will redeem. And God believes all men are redeemable. Amen? And so when we look at this, He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they 
do. If they did it out of ignorance, Father, forgive them. And then I want to bring your attention to the last phrase, and it is, it is finished. It is finished. That's the third page, the first part of number five. The message of His divine authority. It is finished. When Jesus hung on the cross, He did not say like some of us do sometimes, I am finished, like it's over with. Jesus said, it is finished, meaning I have accomplished all I was sent to do. Amen? Jesus did not lack one thing in completing the will of God. He obediently followed the law, every bit of it. And then He passively, going to the cross, became a curse by the standards of the law. Christ became a curse because the Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. But He became a curse that He might bless us. This morning when He says that it's finished, what does it mean? It means that redemption is paid. He's the Passover Lamb. There are no more sacrificing of bulls and goats, turtle doves, meal. None of those sacrifices matter anymore. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, paid the price for you and for me. And because He's paid it, all we have to do is say, Father, forgive me. I confess my sins to Jesus Christ. And Father, forgive me. And when you say, Father, forgive me, guess what? Forgiveness begins to flow from the fountain of God's grace, from the fountain of God's mercy. There's no better experience to have than to know that you are forgiven, your sins are gone, and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Not only does it mean that your salvation has been purchased, but it also means your healing has been purchased. We are healed because of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that by His stripes we were healed. And by faith in His name, we are made whole. Your healing has been purchased. Amen? Do you know that Jesus had 39 stripes put upon His back? The Bible indicates 40 stripes save one. 39 stripes. And did you know that there are 39 major diseases? All other diseases fall under those 39 major diseases. This is recorded by medical science, by the way. What does that mean? There's not a disease among men that God can't heal. Amen? Not a disease. In the Philippines, I've seen leper cleansed by the power of God. I've seen the deaf hear and the lame walk. I saw a man that somehow ate something that caused his foot to deteriorate. And after a period of fasting, went and had prayer with him. His foot was wide open. You could see the bones in the foot. We had prayer with him. And in three days, God closed up the wound. And it started turning pink. You know what pink means? Life. Blood. And the man got full use of that foot. Because God is still a God who heals. Amen? He's a God who heals. He's a God who saves. And He's a God who keeps. Amen. God did not save you to lose you. Amen. God saved you for you to be His child eternally. For you to be with Him in heaven. Amen? Amen. And if we will simply believe, He's already bankrupt heaven one time. He sent Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the best thing He had. Amen? You know, God doesn't think anything about gold except for you need to walk on it when you get to heaven. He don't think anything about jewels except make a wall in it. He don't think anything about pearls except make a gate out of it. Amen? The riches and the, and the things that we think are so great and we have to have. God said, nah, that's not it. 
the most precious thing you own is your soul. And it's so precious that the pearl of great price, Jesus Christ, was given so that soul could be saved. So that soul could have eternal life. So that soul could walk eternally and live eternally in heaven with Almighty God. Our brother's coming.